The Idris Shah Foundation Podcast. Practical psychology for today. Featuring the works of Idris Shah, narrated by David Ott. Welcome to the Idris Shah Foundation Podcast. In this edition of the podcast, we will hear selections from Sufi Thought and Action by Idris Shah. This audio is made available by the Idris Shah Foundation. Observation of a Sufi School by Hoda Azizian The school being observed is represented throughout the Middle East, Farther Asia, Europe, North and South, and the Americas. There are obviously severe limitations to the data and experiences available to the observer in any fieldwork connected with an organization such as a Sufi one. The following may be listed. 1. Many organizations, especially those which are termed spiritual in some sense, welcome anthropological or other investigation. They hope for publicity or respectability through such activities and will often woo the good graces of the investigator. They also generally hope for an increase in membership through any publications, films and so on. The Sufis in contradistinction seek publicity only for such materials as they believe to have a teaching function. Their respectability is such that no body of people in any comparable area can match their repute. In very many communities and in several cultures, Persian, Arabian, Turkish, Central Asian, Indo-Pakistani are some of them, Sufis are regarded as the creme de la creme. They have no need of image building. As for recruitment, all reputable Sufi organizations have for centuries been so inundated with requests for membership that they all maintain a filtration system to admit only the most promising candidates. 2. No legitimate Sufi has so far been found who will concern himself with liturgy, history, literature or personalities either alone or to such an extent as to be styled as a specialist in these areas of the Sufi phenomenon. Hence, no outside investigator will be able to contact a Sufi specialist to give him direct information of the biographies, doings, theories and practices and so on of the Sufis. There is no equivalent to the tendency among other spiritual systems to develop schools of thought or of teaching which specialize in various aspects of the system or its congruent factors. The reason for this state of affairs becomes very clear once a certain principle is grasped. The difficulty is that the grasping of the principle is difficult for the scholar himself, perhaps because it runs counter to his need for the organization of thought and materials. Briefly, the Sufis may be seen to be working with any materials which serve their purpose, quoted from an outstanding modern Sufi teacher. This means that a Sufi will speak or write of the thoughts and doings of a number of Sufi saints, shall we say, only insofar as these bear upon the teaching in which he is involved at the time. This very important technique means that the factual content of the materials being used by a Sufi may be of interest to a student of the Sufis, whereas the materials are being used for another purpose. As an example, it is almost as if we went to church to listen to the parable of the talents and, since we might be economists, we would want to know more about talents, while the voice from the pulpit would be trying to arouse in us an entirely different set of sensations. To put it briefly, the Sufi is teaching his disciples and his effect is measured by their reactions to his teaching. The observer of Sufis is trying to assess the Sufi materials within conventional categories. It is not necessary to accept the Sufis' own estimation of what they are doing to see that their technique is as has been described. 3. The best known and most often studied Sufi groups and organizations must be described from this viewpoint 
as secondary or imitative. This is because the teachers or other mentors of the community concentrate upon deepening the sense of belief of the members, make sure that the rituals are carried out at stated intervals, associate every scrap of information and effort with the movement's stability and progress. In short, here we always have a recognisable cult group, generally invisible to the researcher as such, because the investigator himself most often comes from a society where such cult groups are not regarded, as the Sufis would regard them, as secondary, diluted or distorted in their ideas and practices. The analogy here might be if, let us say, an expert on the entertainment industry or the arts were to try to assess the workings, ideas and motivations of a scholarly enterprise such as a university college. He or she might look for certain indications and might have little patience with others, even if the latter were emphasised to him or her as being central to the scholarly process. All this is not to say that the Sufis themselves are unaware of the problems which we encounter in trying to make sense of what they think and do. On the contrary, since Sufis often have to deal with scholars or other people from conventional backgrounds of thinking, some at least of their materials are devoted to explaining how they approach things and how not to approach them if one is interested in participation. The main difficulty here, of course, is that such materials are not addressed to the outward assessor. They are aimed directly at the would-be learner, and are therefore of limited use to research. Here is a document emanating from a contemporary Sufi activity outlining the emphases, attunement, materials and energy and focus, which the school requires. Sufi Learning System The difficulty of outside people trying to study the Sufi system is due to two main factors. One, they select materials according to existing prejudices and do not know which are superseded or even spurious. And two, Sufi learning is a comprehensive process which has been called both holistic and organic. It cannot be studied from the outside at all without distortion. Within the Sufi system, however, we can isolate three areas which have to be represented and in balance. These are 1. The learner has to be attuned to the teacher and the teaching. This involves his achieving a balanced attitude, neither rejecting nor servile. 2. The materials have to be present and sprinkled. The technique known as scatter has to be employed. They must bypass excess emotional or intellectual activity. And three, the energy and focus of the teaching must be right. This requires allowance for the cyclical nature of the availability of the necessary energy and of the recipient's abilities to absorb it. While lip service to some of these factors is often found in supposed systems of enlightenment, it is noteworthy that in general only one or two of them are attemptedly operated, and generally by people who are not attuned to the factors at all. The result is, of course, fossilization and cultishness. Sufi activity is therefore an overall operation which has to be orchestrated in accordance with the times, the sensitivity, of the learner, harmonised with the other factors. Without this constant activity correctly carried out, higher development is so rare as to be discounted. 4. There seems to be a distinct possibility that the outside observer will either reject the entire Sufi projection, since it does not fit in with the way in which he likes to see spiritual matters expressed, or else that he will wholeheartedly accept the Sufi projection and abandon his former framework of conceptualizations. Each of these attitudes, of course, is equally immature, but both have been found among those who have tried to study the Sufis based as they are on the acceptance or rejection tendency in the human mind, 
they are always characterized by Sufis as symptomatic of a need for the ripening of the consciousness of the individual. Indeed, Sufis go so far as to say that such behavior should be a useful indicator of the frailness and need for real study on the part of the victim. Literal quotation from a present-day Sufi master. In Orientalist and other specialist literature, to be sure, we can find, as if suspended in amber, many signs of these two postures on the part of the researcher, although one may add another which the Sufis do not seem to refer to much, that of qualified support or partial opposition. The Sufis would, perhaps, simply categorize this as the academics hedging his bets. When all is said and done, however, there are certain outstanding characteristics of the Sufi operations which can be seen as registered in the classical books and also in full manifestation in the school. First of all must surely come the combating of the assumptions of the student if these are based on his own tradition as distinct from inward perceptions. The most frequent type of this assumption, says a modern Sufi, may be caricatured for emphasis in the words, I have been waiting here since Wednesday. Where is my share of illumination? Next, we may list what contemporary psychology calls rationalization, but which the Sufis term building on sand. This may be manifested by those who come to Sufis and see them in associations which prove the rightness of the candidate's choice of the Sufis as true teachers. According to the Sufis, as any reader of their books will know, such understanding does not, cannot, come at such an early stage. The Sufi, but not the dervish, system of learning requires that the learner must avoid what nowadays would be called mechanicality, which they term habit training. This is evidenced when the student mistakes the container for the content, traditional Sufi phrase, and when Sufi instructional materials or processes arouse emotions or cause actions in him which may be described as standard or invariable. Dervishes in the past have been known to change habit patterns from those of the ordinary community to certain simplified ones used in their orders, so that, in turn, these patterns may be eliminated. This could be called, in modern parlance, deconditioning. According to the most reputable sources, which means legitimately Sufic ones, this range of practices has not been used by Sufi schools since about the 14th century of the Christian era, when it was introduced as a temporary measure which was applicable in the light of prevailing conditions. It is interesting to note, however, that such is the persistence capacity of this kind of mechanicality that the externals of the outworn system have continued to capture human minds ever since and continue to do so. Examples are the highly organized dervish orders, which persist to this day, whether in Egypt, elsewhere in Africa, occasionally in Turkey, increasingly in Iran, and sporadically in Afghanistan, Pakistan, India and farther east, where Indonesia and Malaysia are examples. It is, incidentally, rumoured that many of these dervish orders, several hundred have been listed and they continue to be founded, were instituted as nurseries. The contention is that an organisation is founded by a Sufi as a means both to associate together people interested in the way and also to give them great social visibility for the purpose of selecting from among their ranks those who might be able to profit from real Sufi teaching. This seems, on the face of it, highly unlikely if one takes into account the deep conditioning which the members of the orders undergo. It would appear that this process is the very contrary of what the Sufis intended and continue to intend. The problems of studying the Sufis are, in a way, paralleled by the problems of studying with the Sufis. 
A contemporary Sufi who is also a distinguished psychologist reports that show or no progress is almost entirely due to the hampering effect of habits of mind. A. Most people constantly switch back to almost automatic ways of looking at things or of approaching problems because they have been automatized by their worldly training. B. Sufi attitudes, as taught by the Sufis and captured in their literature, have to be practiced in order to provide an alternative capacity to the familiar ones like, say, concentration or associativeness or reacting. C. The systematic approach to life and to learning, which is undeniably valuable in many areas, acts as a disabling factor in others. And D. The average man or woman is much more of an automaton than is generally understood. Just as a pedestrian has to change attitudes and actions when travelling in a vehicle, and the focus and action would have again to change if one were driving it, so does the Sufi aspirant need to acquire a different kind of experience than that of the conventionally trained individual. I suggested that all this seems very difficult and unlikely to attract the mystically minded, the people who do not, in general, want to trouble themselves with many words and complicated formulae. The reaction is perhaps a good example of Sufi thinking. The purpose of the Sufis is not to attract those who style themselves, or who are categorized by some, as mystically minded. Indeed, the Sufis as mystics regularly come across people who are thought to be mystically minded, but who are merely vacant, lazy or self-deluded, which must happen in all kinds of human endeavor. Our experience shows that what the Sufis say and do, and are, does indeed attract those who have the ability to become Sufis, as well as attracting many other types. Someone who does not want to trouble himself is someone who may be just as automatized as someone who does want to trouble himself. We do not find that people with such postures constitute the norm or that they influence the Sufi activity in any way. Observations at a Sufi school certainly do show that when many of the preoccupations with what one considers to be oneself have fallen away, certain dramatic changes do take place in the individual. What are these changes, and how do they compare with the changes reported in Sufis from classical times? For those of us who are unused to direct perception of change in people, what is generally referred to as spiritual development and so on, the changes are perceived negatively. Those who formerly had loud voices do not now have low ones. They have voices which are under some kind of control. One can note that some expansion of capacity and outward behaviour in this respect has taken place. People who formerly placed great importance upon how they presented themselves in public now seem able to do so without the painful self-consciousness which one can descry beyond the supposedly comfortable exterior of even the most social people. I am in no doubt that a large degree of extrasensory perception is in operation. People anticipate one's questions and even one's actions. For instance, several times when I wanted a glass of water, someone brought me one. When I wanted to post a letter, stamps were brought. When I was thinking of a book, it was produced for me. But there is one striking factor which cannot be categorized in the present state of knowledge. People who read one's mind only did so when one was not expecting it. Again and again, if I thought of something deliberately to see whether it would communicate to someone else in the community, this simply did not work. But as soon as I stopped trying, especially if I had real thoughts, as distinct from thoughts only designed to test ESP, the mind reading would commence again. Many of the changes in behavior among Sufis are directly opposed to the changes which are ordinarily associated with mystics or the like. As people become more perceptive, 
They dropped habits of behaviour, dress and attitude which had previously seemed characteristic of them. It is only partly that they became less demanding, less flamboyant in dress, less inclined to talk about Sufism. It was literally as if, to quote how an advanced Sufi put it, they do not need those habits now. They were, you see, only forms of behaviour which these people adopted because there was nothing real in them. In the ordinary world, you are surely familiar with the man who shouts to cover up his own lack of certainty. Among the Sufis, when someone knows who and what he is, he or she will not need outside manifestations. This is all because most of the things which you take as indications of what people are really like inwardly are not such at all. They are only roles which people assume because they have no fixed individuality within at all. But not all forms of outward behaviour are taken by the Sufis to indicate the lack of anything inside the individual. Other activities and manifestations do, in fact, signal inward realities, as they are termed. One conspicuous example is when someone does something which is held to be an indicator of his attunement with the path. I was constantly surprised to find that even mundane successes were taken, from time to time, with great joy by Sufi teachers, as indications that this individual was at last attuned to reality. Questioning, whenever it was permitted, the Sufi students had some advantages. From this one learnt, among other things, The Sufic experience is not like any other. If you feel that it is what you have hitherto called religious, even if you feel that it gives you satisfaction, or anything else which you can name, including, I realise that this is right for me, you have not yet felt it. When you do, it is unmistakable. The Sufi current protects itself from those who are unreliable. Ask yourself, can I be relied upon? If the answer is no, you will have to make yourself reliable. The fact is, most people enjoy being unreliable. This is because they think that a variety of reactions makes them free or masters of their fate. It does not. If you do not read Sufi books, especially those designed for the present day, and if you do not avoid those which are essentially spurious, being written by self-styled mystics, you will not, under today's conditions, reach real understanding. To say, I do not want to read, I want to know, and similar things, is a mark of incompetence, however it may appeal to some. Sufism is so easy that it is amazing that so many people find it difficult. All you need to do is stop being false, though you have to practice this first of all in the interchange with the Sufi teaching. There are certain tests which occur while you are being prepared for enlightenment. If the negative side of these appeals to you, you will remain one of the people of the world, or the people with earth sickness. The tests are not secret, since you cannot camouflage your reactions to them. They include 1. Being given an ultimatum, or being asked to choose between two people, or two courses of study, or two forms of behaviour. Whoever asks you to choose between him and others is the false teacher. 2. If you are given anything to say or do in a language foreign to you, in the West this means such things as phrases in Persian or Arabic to repeat, this is done by a false teacher. 3. No true Sufi meetings are held more than once a week. 4. If you are told, or if it is hinted to you that something important is going to happen soon, know that you should abandon that group and seek the alternative. 5. Any supposed Sufi wearing clothes or other apparel foreign to the country in which he is living or which he visits means that you should avoid such a man. 6. Any alleged Sufi teacher who claims or implies that he is on the path of blame, deliberately courting unpopularity, is false. This is never claimed by real Sufis, since the path of blame must be anonymously trod. 
7. Anyone who says or does anything in your presence implying that he has influence in affairs of the world and is exercising it is not a Sufi teacher, unless he is on the path of blame, in which case he is not an instructor, but is only there to signal that you, too, must shun him and approach the legitimate source of teaching which is always present under such circumstances. 8. No real Sufi will claim or imply supreme mastership or being a kutub or concealed teacher, though former dervishes, representatives for limited purposes, of Sufis may do so if they have succumbed to the temptation of exercising power. 9. Similarly, the assumption of military, clerical or official rank is a sign of the deterioration of faculties, earth sickness, which can attack anyone, and which is often found among channels, i.e. people who, though not Sufis, may be related to some of them and employed for low-level and preparatory or test work. 10. The following signs are common when Sufi teachership is claimed by those not entitled to it. Assumption of importance, loss of physical coordination, convincing others, as a major characteristic, that one is taking a deep interest in them, especially when they are ill or in distress. Mysteriousness and hinting, tolerating the deluded, confusing friendship with teaching, organising inconsequential journeys, allowing one's hand to be kissed, appearing on platforms with other mystics, believing that Sufi teaching is a matter of individual opinion, not of inevitability in techniques, allowing exercises, zikr, to be carried out without supervisors to intervene at appropriate moments. I sought elucidation of the foregoing statement from an authoritative Sufi source because of the problem raised by its method of phrasing. Reference is made both to testing and also to falsity. Which were we dealing with, I wanted to know, false schools or genuine schools which wanted to test actual or potential members? The answer to this illuminated a further dimension of Sufi understanding. There are three conditions under which any or all of the considerations referred to may exist. These are a. The false Sufi school or the deluded one, former school now in decay. b. The legitimate school applying tests. c. The representative or representatives of a Sufi school who have developed earth sickness though not themselves Sufis, have through vanity arrogated to themselves the rank of Sufi, generally adopting high pretensions. In reality, though not in appearance, all these work together, just as, say, fire and water work together to produce steam. I then asked what the observer or individual desirous of approaching or remaining in a Sufi school should do if he or she were confronted with any of the phenomena of earth sickness in supposed teachers. This condition, I was told on high authority, never occurs unless the authentic teaching is also accessible. The individual or group should turn to the legitimate teacher who will always be standing by. The commonest form is Form C, when the low-level messenger of the Sufis decides to present himself as a teacher instead of a conduit. He will have been chosen as a secondary-ranking individual precisely because he will still have had such negative characteristics as vanity and the desire for power too strong in him. Such people are generally given these roles as a possible way of eliminating their bad characteristics. They tend, however, to fail in the attempt and to choose the path of false Sufism. It is these who are described in the Sufi traditional phrase, the channel transmits the water but does not itself drink. As to why the errant channel should develop such precise characteristics as loss of physical coordination, organising of inconsequential journeys, the assumption of military, clerical or official rank, and so on, the only answer obtainable from high Sufi sources was 
All these tendencies are well-established symptoms of the result of the triumph of environmental influences on the weak mentation of those who have preferred power to enlightenment. To detail why this happens in this way would be unproductive. As with any illness, the areas attacked weaken first. But could this kind of malaise assail people of otherwise great achievements or of reputable Sufi connections? All Sufi connections are reputable. All human beings are vulnerable to earth sickness. There cannot be any exceptions. How is the ordinary individual to know when his or her Sufi teacher is afflicted in this way? I asked. By applying the assessments of common sense to the problem, just as one does with anything else. It is not necessary for the Sufi to behave in an absurd fashion in order to carry out his mission. But it is likely that a false, deluded or maimed one will. If such is the case with Sufi teachers, does it apply too to those of other persuasions, was my next question. The answer, the Sufis are not a persuasion, they are people who have seen something beyond ordinary perception and who therefore know how to act to make this perceptible to others. But if you mean by this question, are people who are involved in spiritual matters susceptible to deterioration, the answer is, Yes, all of them, as you will see from the abnormal behaviour of supposed teachers from time to time in all religious fields. How then should the person interested in the Sufis or in any other spiritual group defend himself or herself against false, deluded or disabled teachers, I wanted to know. If there is anything about such a teacher which is regarded as abnormal, repulsive or objectionable by a majority of ordinary, non-spiritually minded people, especially when they are informed of all the facts about this individual known to the followers of the teacher, then you will know that he is undesirable. This is, again, because although the true Sufi teacher is otherworldly, he has as a major task the need to present himself as thoroughly acceptable in every way, in every action, in all respects, as acceptable to the ordinary members of the wider community in which his work is set. Does that mean that the unregenerate individual may well be better fitted to judge the Sufi teacher than the disciple? No. It means that the unregenerate is better fitted to see through the false Sufi than the self-deluded. This is why real Sufis seek their disciples from among normal people, often those who have no background of metaphysics. Remember that those who stay with the false or untrue Sufi are almost always people who had a background of bizarre spirituality before they met him. He makes a little progress with normal people, just as the legitimate Sufi makes real progress with virtually nobody else. I have dwelt upon this subject because one can find so little featured on it in spiritual writings in general. It is felt that this fresh information, even though it is supported by traditional Sufi writings and other teachings, is neglected and therefore contributes to the general knowledge of the subject and adds to the information stock available to researchers. This podcast is copyright 2018, the Idris Shah Foundation.